Welcome, everyone. Whether you're listening from somewhere in this world or the next, this planet or another, we're glad you're here to join us as we explore unexplainable truth. I'm your host, Wendy Jaglarski. So several years ago, I was flipping through the channels and caught the tail end of a show that was talking about a guy I had never heard before named Edgar Casey. What I heard in those few minutes was so intriguing that I immediately decided to see if there were any books written about him that I could read. This is when I stumbled upon a large book written by Sidney D. Kirkpatrick called Edgar Casey, an American Prophet. The way he tells the life story of this fascinating man had me hooked immediately, and I was recommending the book to everyone I knew. And when I started this podcast, I knew I wanted to have Sidney Kirkpatrick on so everyone could hear about his research into this amazing man. So right now, I'd like to welcome award-winning documentary filmmaker and best-selling historical author, Sidney Kirkpatrick. Hey, Sidney, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me on, Wendy. What a pleasure. Yes, absolutely. I'm so excited to have you on. Um, I'm really looking forward to you being able to share with people the story of Edgar Casey and who he was. I was honestly surprised that I had never heard about him before, you know, 10 years ago, because he's such a huge figure. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. Um, you can tell the audience uh, from your experience. I know you've had unprecedented access to all of his files. So very excited to hear what you have to say tonight. Yeah, well, in you know, in, in many respects, I, I view my life sort of uh, B.C. and A.C. before K.C. and after K.C. Um, I, you know, I, I, I had uh, built up quite a, a, a reputation um, for my books as an author, as a magazine article writer, uh, before I encountered Casey, and and when I when I finally encountered Casey, similar in in some respects um, to how you did, I, I knew nothing about him before. Um, it really just changed my life, changed changed you know how I treat my children, how I treat my wife, um, you know how I tackle subjects. It, it's uh, it, it's it's such an incredible thing um, for me. You know, there there was a there was a woman involved. I um, I, I had um, uh, my children uh, went to the Waldorf school system. I don't know if you're familiar with the Waldorf school no. system, but it was um, uh, begun by a German mystic, Rudolf Steiner. And mm. uh, I wasn't the least bit interested in. Uh, in the mysticism part of it. I just love the school because it was nearby and they, they had a lot of great outdoor activities and things. And um, um, the administrator of, of that school uh, was this huge Edgar Casey fan. And, uh, and she, she found out that I was a best-selling author and um, was determined to get a, a book about the psychic Edgar Casey out of me. And she kept, uh, you know, uh, filling my school mailbox with all things Casey, Casey readings, Casey this, Casey that, and uh, I, I just I couldn't take it seriously. Here, here was a um, a man um, who did most most of his work really between the two world wars. He started out giving readings just before World War One, and died uh, right at the end of World War Two, and. He was a psychic uh, alleged to be able to uh, lay down on a couch and put himself into a, a trance state, and in that trance state could answer any question put to him, and did so, and and did so for uh, almost you know nearly 45 years, um, twice a day every day, and just came out with just astonishing. Um, Information, um, uh, you know, we we uh, often associate psychics with sort of delivering um, sort of vague, ambiguous um, uh, information, things that could be uh, interpreted differently. Well, what what makes Casey so absolutely astonishing is the specificity of his readings. 
you know, names, dates, body parts. Um, uh, uh, Casey, who's, who's, you know, perhaps best known uh, for his holistic health readings, would, would go organ by organ through someone's body. And the patient, the person, didn't have to be in the same room, in the same town, or even in the same country. Um, Casey could somehow reach out and what he delivered were, were specifics, things that could easily be verified. Um, I wouldn't say, uh, or, you know, to, to my mind, Casey is, is perhaps the, the best, the greatest psychic uh, of the 20th century. Um, but um, arguably, you can't argue that is the, he's not the best documented. And uh, that's what was so intriguing to me and what launched uh, research, which is now I've been, you know, working on studying Edgar Casey for almost three decades now. Yeah, that's amazing, and he has uh, over fourteen thousand documented readings, right? Yeah, uh, um, you know when um, uh, when when uh, the administrator when, when this woman Nancy. Uh, uh, started talking about gay curious. We had this terrible back and forth tug of war. Uh, you know, uh, she, she, she was lovely. She was intelligent. And she seemed to be very well read, but she just put all of the stock in, in Edgar Casey and uh, um, she used it as a resource. You know, uh, uh, Casey spoke on a myriad of different subjects and I just couldn't buy into it. I, I, I said, anybody who put their faith in a psychic, or to visit a psychiatrist. So we had this terrible back and forth on this tug of war. And I just didn't buy it. And I was very skeptical. And um, uh, so she challenged me to take a look, take a, a really close look. And, and we went to Virginia Beach, which is where Edgar Casey lived for the latter portion of his life. And there's a, a, um, a very big library, which houses his papers and, and um, they, you know, it's an organization, they give lectures and um, we went into the archives and what I thought would take a day, I would go in and I would find uh, and, and point Nancy to show her the error of her ways, show her that uh, these stories about this man had been, you know, embellished or embroidered over the years and that if you really looked hard at them, uh, it would unravel. And so I, I went in to, to show her the error of her ways. And one day it became five, became two weeks, and, and I was just stunned. I think the first thing that strikes anyone, um, as, as you said, is the sheer volume of the readings. You know, Casey uh, doesn't give, didn't give... Um, you know, 500, 1,000 readings, but um, there are four, over 14,000 totally documented readings. And when I say documented, there was a stenographer uh, sitting down next to him, taking down everything that was said, plus the witnesses. You know, they, he didn't do these uh, alone, but there were often 6, 10, 15 people, sometimes as many as 30 people would sit and listen to these readings. So you have some 14,000 readings. And, um, and then the second thing that, that hits you when, when you go into the Casey archives at Casey Vault, as I said earlier, is the specificity. Their names, dates, body parts. Um, and it, it just becomes uh, uh, overwhelming. And uh, then the sheer documentation uh, behind these readings um, and, and something gradually uh, begins to happen with, with, with almost anyone who has gone in and started examining these documents because you stop asking yourself, well, did Edgar Casey do what he is said to have done? Because the, the evidence is just overwhelming. I mean, it's just totally overwhelming. Uh, and you start saying, uh, well, how did he do it? And I suppose that's the rabbit hole uh, one falls, falls into. And, uh, uh, and it's been a blessing I had that I haven't climbed out of that rabbit hole. And uh, so I started uh, writing a book 
um, which ended up taking five years, that first book on Casey. And I went from a skeptic to a, uh, to absolutely convinced of the truth of it and, and uh, haven't looked back since. Yeah. It's, it's this incredible. Sort of long answer to your question, but yeah, uh, you know, that, that's the amazing things about, about Casey and uh, what an exciting time uh, to be studying Casey, you know, when, um, uh, when Nancy and I first started approaching this, my big regret was that Casey had died before I was born and, uh, and I wouldn't get a chance to have my own Casey reading. Um, and, and yet, uh, now perhaps, uh, there couldn't be a better time, uh, to be researching, uh, Casey. Uh, simply because uh, the holistic health movement has finally caught up to Casey in a very serious way. Things that uh, were dismissed as farcical, uh, ludicrous, you know, uh, treatments Edgar Casey recommended, mm-hmm. um, which were just, uh, just considered silly at the time. And you would be hard pressed to find a physician uh, who, who would, conduct the treatments as Edgar Casey recommended. And yet today it's, it's state of the art. Um, yeah. You know, back yeah, in, was, in 1905. Well, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, because he was born in 1877 and then passed away right. in 1945. So yeah, that was way ahead of time. He was ahead of his time. Well, he, he, he the, the, the treatments themselves, like, um, uh, I would say, you know, out of those 14,000 or so readings, a good seven or 8,000 are on medical conditions. And uh, the reason for that is that it was a physician uh, who first helped to discover. And um, Edgar Casey uh, recommended a treatment uh, for himself in trance. I mean, he was... Um, uh, well, anyway, he, he was surrounded by physicians very early in his career. And because of that, he became known as a psychic diagnostician, someone you would, con- you would turn to if you'd exhausted, uh, you know, standard allopathic uh, remedies and things and, and physicians. And uh, so you, tur- you turn to him and... Uh, Invariably, you know, Casey came out with a treatment. Uh, much, I would say, many of the many of the treatments are standard, what you might expect. But there were all, a whole uh, series uh, that uh, flabbergasted um, physicians. Uh, psoriasis, for example, you know, which is uh, considered a skin condition, and. You know, I don't know if you know psoriasis, you know, the discoloration of the skin very often. And Casey mm-hmm. said that um, uh, this is really not a skin condition, but it's a, uh, a problem with the lower colon and that toxins uh, were leaching out of the colon, the, the, the lining, the thinning of the walls of the colon. Um, and toxins were leaching out into the system and escaping through the skin. Um, and so the treatment for psoriasis, you know, according to Casey, was a total radical change of diet and uh, nutrients that, that would help build up the walls of the colon. Um, most remarkable, I think, I mean, there's just, just this is why there's so many subjects we could touch on. But I think to my mind, the most remarkable thing going on today uh, with Edgar Casey is for epilepsy. Um, uh, you know, 99% of physicians, well, almost everybody would consider epilepsy today uh, to be a uh, neural disorder, a problem with the brain. And uh, Casey said that was not the case. And uh, Casey said problem is with the abdomen. You know, it is not what one would think. And uh, he's, he, Casey says, so there are, um, according to Casey, that there are neurotransmitters or there are transmitters uh, in the abdomen uh, which have been damaged and they're misfiring and sending false signals to the brain, which results in, in an epileptic condition. 
and that the problem is not with the brain, but it's with the abdomen. And Casey said very often um, uh, damage has been done to the abdomen because uh, a person has had bulimia, for example. Uh, it's interesting how many uh, fashion models uh, ultimately suffer epilepsy. Um, there's an indication right there, but that the, these abdomens can be damaged even as, as an infant, even in um, during pregnancy, a mother can accidentally harm her fetus's abdomen somehow or another. But anyway, K Casey said the problem is with the abdomen, and you treat the abdomen, and th this is something that that was just totally dismissed in Casey's day as oh well, Casey must have had this wrong. And yet today, um, uh, physicians in uh, there's a, a, a brand new research study about a year and a half old um, that was done in Florida on on epileptics and um, studying that very question. And well over um, ninety percent of the female epileptics studied did indeed have these. Uh, problems with the abdomen. It's just, uh, wow. so, so I guess the point here is, is that uh, it really is an exciting time to be studying Casey and, uh, and uh, we're just, just pleased to have been given that opportunity. Yes. Yes. And it seems so many of the things that, you know, if I remember correctly, so many of the things that um, do go wrong with people medically are tied to their digestive system. And that, that wasn't really, that wasn't known back in the day. No. And uh, I mean, imagine, you know, there's some of the more remarkable things that came out of Casey very early on in his career, the, um, uh, say regarding mental illness, um, you know, family came to Casey, um, uh, Mary Hall, um, and and she was in a mental institution, and it was you know put into a straitjacket. And Casey gave a reading for her and said it was an impacted wisdom tooth, and that um, some, somehow or another the way this tooth was formed and impacted was um, uh, uh, stopping you know the correct blood flow into her brain, and that if you removed the wisdom tooth. Uh, she would be cured, and, and actually that was the case. Wow, incredible. Yeah, there's. I bet there's a whole slew of things that that he'll still yet to be, you know, proven correct mm -hmm. that we yeah. still haven't but, caught up but to. The science is catching up in, in a major way now, and, uh, uh, I, you know, it's an exciting time uh, for all sort of believers in psychic phenomena uh, because, you know, it's becoming mainstream. Science has accepted uh, the multidimensionality uh, of the universe. And, um, and so uh, things that, uh, you know, things that, that gave Casey trouble in his lifetime, you know, we now understand. And, you know, Casey gave readings on almost any subject you can think of. I mean, just, just uh, everything, uh, you know, he pioneered. Um, uh, it was the sort of first uh, out of the gate with reincarnation and talking about past lives. And, and yeah. so there's just this profound, huge amounts of documentation. And uh, uh, what's, what's just so unusual about Casey is, is that, it's so well documented, you know, with, with these readings now, and you can uh, get them on a computer database. You can search hundreds, thousands of pages, uh, say for like um, um, cures for breast cancer. And, and uh, you can search and study this material um, in ways that you never could before. And it just is, it's a remarkable database. It's a wonderful resource. And, uh, uh, I thank Nancy for turning me on to that a long time ago. Yes, yes, I thank Nancy too, because you were really my my uh, the door into this for me. Um, some of my favorites were I remember 
I don't remember the exact amount, but wasn't it like three almonds a day is supposed mm-hmm. to be extremely beneficial? I, I was just on the phone today with a physician uh, who's helping to pioneer a study uh, of um, uh, the, the impact of raw nuts, almonds in particular, on, on various cancers. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, again, this is something that in Casey's day uh, would not have been taken seriously. And yet today there, there, there are two studies linking exactly what, you know, Casey was saying. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's really exciting. It's like a renaissance going on, going on. Yes. And I think it's worth mentioning too, that he didn't have uh, an education past eighth grade. And yeah, no, so it, all of this yeah, stuff exactly. weren't things that he would have known otherwise. Um, and he also didn't get rich off of making, off of doing these readings. So it wasn't some right. type of a scam because he was still, um, you know, fairly poor while he was giving away these 14 plus thousand readings throughout his life that yeah. really did take a toll he, on his he, health as well. He, yeah. He, he believed this was a gift from God uh, and that it was not to be traded upon and it was not to be sold. Uh, and so for, for most of his career, he earned a living as a photographer and, um, um, actually, let's step back, if you will, and, sure. and talk about the sort of evolution, uh, you know, of how Edgar Casey uh, came to be Edgar Casey. You know, he's a no, he's a name that's sort of made perhaps best known in your parents' generation, mm-hmm. um, but is coming right back into style today um, because of these readings. Um, we know, uh, for example. Uh, what a strange and unusual child he was, you know, that, that these were, that there were things going on at a very, very early age, long before he gave readings. Um, he had, you know, uh, imaginary playmates. Uh, many of us um, have what would be called imaginary playmates, only, um, you know, his had first and last names. They came from uh, exotic locales, the places that I, uh, four and five year old uh, growing up uh, in a remote farm, you know, in Beverly, Kentucky, shouldn't have even known about Um, all all kinds of, uh, of interesting uh, curiosities um, going on as a, as a child. And and Casey uh, just as a, as an infant or as an adolescent started and are having this reputation which uh, spread uh, throughout the county. Um, um, one of the uh, sort of important incidents of his uh, earliest childhood was um, him playing baseball or playing ball at school. Uh, you know, there's a game, I don't know if, if you know it, it's not played much these days, called Monkey in the Middle with a child running between two people throwing a ball mm-hmm. and uh, Casey got hit in the back with a baseball and got knocked out. And, um, you know, he was nine, 10 years old. And uh, he really, it, it seemed like he was in a coma for a while. He just, you know, just totally blacked out. And uh, um, while he was blacked out, he suddenly started speaking and you could communicate with him. And this was, you know, one might argue this was uh, the very first trance reading Casey gave um, uh, because um, uh, he, he revealed all kinds of information that a schoolboy uh, shouldn't really have a handle on. He was talking about uh, the relationship his teacher was having with the superintendent of schools. <laughs> he gave the uh, results of the presidential election, which was then going on. Um, and then he gave a, uh, you know, description about how he, Edgar Casey, uh, his wound in the back of his, you know, neck could be, um, could be treated. So you, you might argue even he was giving readings back then, but that was just one of a whole lot of interesting, um, 
behaviors going on with with his child. Um, he was very close to his grandfather, and um, uh, who was a very very successful tobacco farmer. In, in and they were extremely close. There there were points periods in Edger's uh, very early life uh, where his. Uh, uh, parents where his father went bankrupt, lost his job. Um, his father was very much of a failure in many regards. He was also alcoholic. Um, and uh, Edgar was often left with his with his grandparents to take care of. And he often uh, used to sleep between his grandmother and grandfather. And, and the grandmother always told these stories about how um, Edgar... Uh, as a young child, as you know, sleeping between them would reach up at night and grab his grandfather's beard and clutch onto it very tightly. And the, the grandmother, Sarah, had to peel his fingers back so uh, Tom, the grandfather, could, um, could get some sleep. But uh, Tom was really the first um, uh, experience uh, with death that uh, Edgar had. And uh, as the story is told, Edgar was riding back from the fields on the back of his grandfather's saddle. And so they were riding back from the, from the fields and um, the grandfather lowered Edgar um, onto the ground because he wanted to water the horse. So he, he lowered Edgar next to this, uh, on the shore of this pond and walked the horse out into the pond. Um, and there was a water moccasin or something that spooked the grandfather's horse and the horse reared up and uh, eventually kicked the father, grandfather off the horse and the hooves came down and crushed uh, his grandfather's chest. And so uh, Edgar saw his grandfather die. And absolutely no question about that. He was you know, six, 10 feet away and mm-hmm. it had... Um, a most profound effect because uh, almost immediately uh, grandfather was appearing uh, to, to, to Edgar in the barn and started talking to Edgar. There were, so there were, he was, Edgar was conversing with the dead, you know, uh, when he's seven, eight years old, um, you know, it became quite a problem in the family. I think uh, his aunt Lulu thought he ought to be taken to a hospital or, maybe the church, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but he was, uh, he was fortunate in many respects. I think that um, Edgar was surrounded by people who loved him. And um, there, there's a, a wonderful photograph in his uh, elementary school class. And you look at the photograph and you turn it over and in the legend uh, which identifies the name of the students, you know, three quarters of them are fellow Casey's relatives. And I think all of us have had um, uh, what we might consider a kook in the family. Um, I know in my family, many people at this point consider me a kook. Um, <laughs> but be, be that as it may, uh, in the family, you protect it and you protect that person. And, uh, you know, and Edgar was protected, so he had a very hot house environment. Um, we we know that there are um, you know many psychics who um, uh, who who've had these imaginary playmates, um, uh, where and family members who die. There's a, 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 a wonderful psychic that that I admired very much, who's uh, sort of uh, Casey's generation, Eileen Garrett. I don't know if the name rings any bells to you today, but uh, she was an Irish born psychic um, and she had a, a, a childhood very similar to Edgar's only, only in Ireland in a small rural community. And, um, and she had imaginary playmates and uh, she saw auras, you know, like just like Edgar Casey's a child, the energy fields around people. And um, in Eileen's case, uh, it was her mother and father who died. Uh, one was a Catholic, one was a Protestant, and um, they couldn't. Um, I don't know, they, you know, the mixed religion in that little village in Ireland where they were didn't work, and uh, they 
they killed themselves. They jumped down a well. Oh, and wow. uh, they were the first to come and start, you know, appearing to little Eileen, just like Edgar's grandfather appeared to him. And um, there's a lot of really interesting parallels with Eileen Garrett and Edgar Casey, um, um, uh, mostly because of the specificity of their readings. I mean, Eileen Garrett was very, very good. Uh, but what Eileen Garrett did was in, in sp- most specifically was channel dead people. You know, you, you could come, you people, she was like an open door you could go through. And mm-hmm. uh, so many of her readings are interesting study. In fact, um, one of the most uh, um, enlightening readings that Casey gave was for Eileen Garrett on the same day in the same house that Eileen Garrett gave Edgar Casey a reading. So it's really interesting to compare these two readings. And Eileen Garrett sees the spirit or, you know, soul force of Edgar traveling to whatever dimension it is that he retrieves his information. And, and Edgar Casey sees Eileen Garrett. And uh, so it's an interesting combination. It's a psychic giving a reading on a psychic. Yes. Yeah, you don't hear that very often. I don't know how I often. ever got off on that tangent. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because I'll sense, I'll look. Just deep. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll look her up sometime. I I'd never heard of her. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. uh but there's another psychic probably bears mentioning. Uh, Peter Herkos, and Herkos is sort of close to he would be your father's generation, and. Um, um, he is of interest in, in regards to Edgar Casey, in that he too had a uh, blow to the head when he was young. And I'm not saying that uh, Edgar Casey getting hit in the back of the head with a baseball is what um, triggered uh, his psychic abilities um, or contributed, but it is interesting how many important psychics. Uh, got head injuries, and Peter Herkos had been um, Peter had been a young house painter uh, in Holland um, when the Nazis marched in to take over the country, and he had been conscripted by the Nazis to paint army barracks, and he was up two floors on a ladder and uh, fell off the ladder, had an accident, came down on his head. Uh, crushed his part of his skull and was uh, sent to the hospital where a uh, a Nazi surgeon uh, who was experimenting on triage, you know, they were getting, you know, Nazis, well, all soldiers were getting a lot of head injuries. And they said, oh, here's this, you know, great Dutch kid we can experiment on. And in, in Peter Herkos's case, they literally took the top of his skull cap off and put a plate, metal plate there. And when, um, you know, I'm sure the Nazi physicians marveled that uh, this little Dutch boy actually lived through the operation, but when he came out of uh, uh, his coma, when he came out from under the anesthetic, he had this incredible ability called psychometry where he could hold, you could put something in his hand and he would have visions of, of, uh, of what was associated with that object. He could see who had handled it last. And he saw it just like uh, Edgar Casey did in some respects, like you were looking at a, a movie trailer or something. That detailed, you could, um, you know, uh, Herkos is sort of most famous today for, the boss, for doing the readings on the Boston Strangler case. And um, and he broke that case wide open because uh, he could handle one of the scarves that were used to strangle the women and uh, see the woman, see the circumstances and describe them in perfect detail and describe the killer. And uh, um, anyway, it we went a long way to solving that case. But it, but it is interesting to when you can start studying the phenomena of many different psychics Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm convinced, you know, Edgar Casey had it all. He was really beyond any of these others, but it is interesting. You gain insights into, uh, 
uh, into Edgar Cayce's experience by studying these other psychics. I think the, the most important takeaway really from his childhood is that you can view his life his, his early childhood as, as a process of, of trying to come to grips with what this, what was happening to him, the very real fear of, of what was going on, where he would hear voices uh, and eventually see angels. Um, and so you could view his early childhood as just trying to overcome the very real fear that uh, knowledge of how different his experience was than others. And uh, when he eventually came to grips with that, uh, and there were surra- he was surrounded by people who helped him do that, um, we have the legacy we have today. You know, so many thousands of you know, these documented readings. And the ability now today, you know, in 2021, to uh, go back and study this, information uh, and you can study it in in a new light. Um, One of the biggest um, revelations that came to me very early on was how many famous people uh, Casey gave readings for. You know, here was someone who uh, um, uh, barely, you know, eked out an income in his life. And there, there were times in his career when he was so poor that they were transcribing uh, these trance sessions on wrapping paper, uh, you know, mm-hmm. from a butcher. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, here's someone who gave a reading for Thomas Edison, uh, for Nikola Tesla, um, for engineer, you know, the science readings just blow my mind. I mean, how many science readings he gave for important scientists uh, and businessmen, you know, uh, um, uh, engineers at uh, what became IBM, uh, RCA, um, the uh, car manufacturers. It's just, I mean, the, the, the number of important people at readings uh, is, is really is mind blowing. And we didn't know about it uh, because in Casey's time, um, he didn't want to trade about it. He didn't, he didn't go on, you know, the equivalent of talk shows. Um, uh, he believed that, you know, as, as, as you've, pointed out very early on that this was, uh, you know, he believed it to be a gift of God and it was not to be traded upon. He didn't talk about him. And even after he died, uh, the readings were given numbers uh, just so that it was not considered an invasion of someone's privacy. I mean, for example, uh, you know, George Gershwin, uh, whom he gave readings for, uh, didn't want his medical condition being known about, so he was given a number. And uh, Irving Berlin, uh, I mean, just, uh, so people didn't know about it, didn't know who were actually receiving these trans readings until very recently, until actually Nancy and I uh, started our research and, and went down that rabbit hole. And uh, what a revelation that was. Uh, yeah. Did you discover the actual impact uh, that that he had on his generation and beyond? I mean, we know, um, uh, for example, Elvis Presley. Uh, people around him, uh, he he was too young really to have received readings himself, but Elvis Presley was surrounded. Uh, by people who had Edgar Casey readings, and uh, Elvis Presley studied Casey. Uh, actually, Elvis Presley was reading a book uh, about Edgar Casey and reincarnation on the very night he died. Uh, wow. Marilyn Monroe was using beauty products um, that were recommended in Casey treatments on how to stay youthful looking, um, which, which. Uh, were recommended to her by uh, a name you may not know, Gloria Swanson, great silent film star um, from that movie. What's that movie? Sunset Boulevard? Okay. <laughs> okay. I've heard anyway, of it. It's, a, it's, it's it. a different generation, but it really is. A, a, uh, it became um, really exciting for us to discover uh, how many important people Casey was giving readings for and um, uh, and the impact that it may have had on them. Um, 
Alcoholics Anonymous, for example. Um, Casey was giving a reading for a uh, young woman in Akron, Ohio. Um, Irene Cyberling. And Irene Cyberling was uh, interested in health, in health treatments first. And, and so she was asking uh, Casey uh, for health recommendations for herself and then her sisters and then her brothers. And eventually, um, uh, one of her brothers who, who had uh, was, became alcoholic, it was a real case of PTSD, came back from you know, shell shock to a certain degree and self-medicating himself with alcohol. Um, uh, so, so she, so she started asking, you know, uh, re- readings, um, on alcoholism, the nature of alcoholism and what you can do about it and, uh, and got really interesting information. And, you know, we now know today, uh, that Irene Cyberling, was the was one of the main engines behind the creation of Alcoholics Anonymous? That uh, she had Bill Wilson staying in her guest house, the same guest house that Edgar Casey stayed in in Akron, Ohio. And uh, so, isn't it absolutely fascinating how uh, perhaps the success of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, could partially be said to be drawn from the Edgar Casey work? And that's something that uh, uh, just was not known until we started digging deeper into these readings. I know yeah, I'm going it really off was on, no... on all of these tangents. But, no, uh, no, I, but it's it, fine. It, it's just it's so interesting. And, um, um, yeah, there's no topic uh, off limit for, you know, that for him, he, he really delved yeah. into everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. What are some of the things that he said about the pineal gland? Well, uh, the pineal gland, of course, as, as I'm sure many of your, your uh, listeners uh, know, um, is right there in the, in, in the forehead, essentially, area. And um, this was directly related to uh, psychic uh, or telepathy, as, as you know, uh, associated with it, perhaps it's the um, you know depending upon you know how one might look at it um, uh, as a, as a conduit uh, for telepathic information uh, and the psychic and for everything from empathy on down and um, uh, Casey in a series of readings for a uh, you know, stockbroker in New York. Uh, Start giving information on how to awaken his pineal gland, and um, it, it, he, he gives us a series of recommendations. Uh, uh, one of which is very interesting. The uh, young man is told to um, uh, wait till two or three a.m. in the morning when there isn't a whole lot of uh, interference going on and he can be alone and, and uh, I guess the, the rest of the world's asleep and that's the time for him to do his meditation. And um, um, Casey gives readings on, on how he can um, excite his different chakras. And um, anyway, what, uh, he was very successful at it and he went from a a junior broker to owning his own seat on the stock exchange, he and his brother. Wow. That's so great. it must have been very successful. Yes. Yeah, and there were some some of my favorite topics were what he had to say about Egypt and the pyramids and the Sphinx. Would you mind touching on yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, we as as you know, uh, we referenced uh he started the case he started out, you know, doing his medical reading. And if those medical readings hadn't been such a astonishing success, you know, uh, things that were easily verified, you know, if it hadn't just blown people away, you know, um, uh, the, the, you know, the 
overwhelming truth of those readings where you just couldn't argue how how did this guy do this how did he know that my mother uh, in, um, in in Wisconsin uh, has a temperature of 101.2 right now and is and as is suffering from cirrhosis of the liver I mean th- these things are impossible I mean you, you just anyway if he hadn't had such, such incredible success with these medical readings the rest of what came through may have been suspect uh, but the fact that he was so accurate in these started people uh, to, to think long and hard about the others and uh, mm-hmm. one of the very first sort of non-medical reading questions that were put to him was uh, someone wanted uh, him to explain a passage in the Bible, and it was this, you know, a story of Jesus and and Casey with the same uh, speed, with the same sort of seeming accuracy, said, "Oh no, no, uh, um, that's the story that's been told, but that's not what happened." And Casey went on to describe exactly uh, what Jesus said and how it was. Um, changed at the, I think it was the Second Council of Nicaea when they were compiling the books of the Bible. And so what opened up suddenly was, were people asking a myriad of different kinds of questions, you know, about ancient history uh, and, of course, the future predictions. Uh, Tabloid Casey always um, stresses the prediction readings, and that's a subject we should talk about. But um, you asked about the really ancient history, the readings on Atlantis and Lemuria. Um, You know, Atlantis, of course, the supposed mythic kingdom in the Atlantic and Lemuria, which was in in the Pacific. And, um, you know, for Edgar Cayce, those readings became just a shock to his system because um, he was a devoted churchman. Uh, first disciples of Christ, and then later a Presbyterian. And uh, but he was you know, a, a deacon, church secretary, uh, an avid reader of the Bible. Every, every once a year, every year he would read the Bible through and through. And suddenly, in these readings, um, are presented the specter of reincarnation. And uh, you know what was he to make of that? Um, uh, one of the very first. Uh, reincarnation readings was uh, for a man named Arthur Lammers, who was a printer in Dayton, Ohio, a very successful printer. And um, he was being, uh, questions were about his vocation. And uh, Casey in trance, and, and he's very deeply, uh, we didn't mention that earlier, but how deeply Casey went into trance. He was so deep, it, it, you could stick pins in him and he wouldn't flinch. Um, well, so Arthur Lammers asks this question, and uh, Casey says, well, uh, you're drawn to printing, essentially, uh, because of your experience as a monk in a previous lifetime, presumably in a scriptorium. And uh, that opened up all kinds of questions for Casey. Uh, uh, it opened up uh, whole doors to astrology. Um, and so... Uh, several five or six thousand readings are given over to uh, past life impacts one has on their present life, and also uh, astro- astrology on you know the impact that the planets and configurations of planets have. Um, all astrologers, of course, will be quick to tell you um, how you know. Uh, uh, how Venus, you know, the house of Venus, or or what it, what impact um, the planets may have on you, uh, but Casey tells us why, and uh, that's one of the real interesting differences uh, with the Casey information on astrology, because he tells you why, and uh, gosh, when when I first read those things, I I was just so skeptical. I said I didn't believe it for a minute. Casey says. Um, um, that between lifetimes on, uh, you know, what is he would describe as university earth, um, a soul sojourns in other dimensions on, in other planets. And so mm-hmm. if uh, Saturn has an impact on you astrologically, 
uh, it's because you've spent time in in the dimension of Saturn. And so when uh, that swings closest to the Earth, you resonate with that. Um, I know, I, I know for uh, skeptics, this is something easy to scoff at. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there, there's there is evidence uh, of sort of the truth of um, or suggestive of the truth of um, of astrology. I I know I won't uh, can't be can't convince people. Uh, uh, However, there, there are interesting studies that are done, you know, like of athletes, um, you know, uh, fame, you know, if you make lists of athletes, you'll, you'll find uh, how many uh, were born with Jupiter, you know, in the rising sign. Um, these are things that, uh, you know, come, come through in the Casey readings. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I love all of the stuff he said about reincarnation. And I know being, you know, a devout uh, Christian like he was, it was hard for him, you know, when he would awaken from these trances, he wrestled with what he had, you know, said while he was in the trance. And so much so that Mm -hmm. he didn't even follow some of the things, you know, medically or whatever, some of the things he would say, um, he wouldn't follow them himself. But yet in this trance, he had this, limitless knowledge um mm-hmm. some of the you know more uh controversial stuff that fascinates me as well is some of the stuff he talked about uh, about jesus in the bible um mm-hmm. could you go into that yeah. a little bit as well yeah yeah um well um It's very Christian oriented. The readings are, uh, though mm-hmm. not all of them. Uh, you know, there, there, there's he give, does give readings for Muslims, um, Hindus, uh, but primarily uh, there are there readings for Christians, and Christians are interested in interpretations of the Bible and uh, and other. Uh, Christ-like or, you know, Christian-related subjects. So uh, there's a great body of information. And and as a matter of fact, if um, um, we're very close, we're probably a month or so away. If you visit uh, uh, my website, um, you can, it's uh, Casey, it's called, it's very simple to remember. It's CaseyUniverse.com. And it's Casey with C-A-Y-C-E. CaseyUniverse.com, and and I've got I post articles on it, and uh, there's videos and things like this. It, it's um, but very soon, uh, perhaps in the next two months, we're going to be uploading uh, what we're uh, tentatively calling the Casey Bible or the Bible according to Casey, and it's Wonderful. a document that's almost you know seven thousand pages long, and it's. Uh, on one side of the page is, is the verse or passage in the Bible, and the other side of the page is what Casey has to say about it. I'm just throwing that out there because it, it will be an amazing resource. Um, yeah, but, definitely. But, uh, uh, but certainly, you know, angels, angelic beings do appear in the Casey readings, um, uh, as do, uh, um, you know, after-death experiences, so, uh, one of the most interesting to my mind uh, it was for an engineer and um, named uh, Marion Stansel. And Marion Stansel had been a garage mechanic in a small town in Alabama. And he'd gotten drafted into World War I and uh, sent into the trenches uh, where he promptly got gassed, you know, mustard gas, and it burned the inside of his lungs. And he was uh, brought into triage uh, where he promptly died. And he was dead for uh, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, this, he, his story follow, follows the pattern of what today we know is a very classic, you know, out-of-body, near-death experience. But at that time, you know, this was, uh, you know, 1917, 1918, uh, this was not 
a commonly understood story the way Marion told it, but but today we recognize it for what it was. Anyway, Marion died, and he found himself, you know, classic walking towards the light, and he suddenly finds himself among uh, friends and, and family who passed on, and he realized immediately that he was dead because all the people around him in this near-death experience were dead. And uh, Marion didn't want to die. And he immediately threw a fit and he said, I want to see Jesus. And, and his friends and deceased friends and families and other who were there said, well, it doesn't exactly work like that. You just can't, you know, ask to see Jesus and just come with us and you'll understand and it'll be, you'll be happy and whatever. And he says, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. I need to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus right away. And he just really put his foot down and wasn't going to move forward. And, um, you know, I miss him. And lo and behold, uh, Jesus came to him in, in this experience. And he had a con- conversation with Jesus. And Marion explained that he didn't, um, he couldn't leave. He did, it was not a good time to die because his mother and his sisters, uh, he was the sole income earner and they depended upon him and he had to get back. And he had to get back to Alabama and ASAP. And, uh, and they had this sort of negotiation, apparently. And Jesus said, well, what are you going to do for me? And Marion said, I'll do anything you want. Just, just tell me what, and I'll go do it. And so Jesus said, well, I will tell you. Um, so, you know, uh, but he didn't tell him right that moment. And um, uh, Marion Stansel suddenly came back to life on the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the tent camp medic unit in, in, in World War II, and his lungs were healed, and he was a healthy guy. And so it was, a, it was considered miraculous, considering how long he'd been dead. He went back to Alabama and waited patiently for a vision or something from Jesus, and uh, waited, 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 and never seemed to come. And then it came but it came through Edgar Casey, And mm. in this reading, um, which, which is really exciting for today, you know, more relevant perhaps today than ever before, um, uh, who or what coming through Casey um, uh, gives instructions on how to build uh, what would be termed like a perpetual motion motor, how to build a device uh, that, according to Casey, according to his re- these readings, is that once you start it turning, it will not stop. And it doesn't run anything run on anything except air and water. And uh, it's a real interesting um, uh, description on, you know, in these readings on how it was to be built and how it was, to, you know, how it could be used. It looked something like uh, an evaporative cooler, which is a sort of earlier version of an air conditioner. And one of the challenging things about building it is you had to build it or you had to assemble it underwater. And you had to assemble it uh, with a certain north-south, east-west alignment. So you had to assemble it underwater in a certain, you know, direction. And I, and once you had it up and running, he said, as soon as you got it started turning, it would just keep turning for as long as you kept it in that uh, north-south position. Um, and Marion Stansel was to build it. And uh, so he, he, <laughs> as the story went, uh, he got to work building it. Um, but this was one of the great, uh, one of the fun stories that, uh, uh, Nancy and I researched, and uh, we eventually met. Marion Stansel had passed on, uh, but we met his son and had a nice long conversation with his son about him trying to build this machine. And if he had gotten it constructed, if if it had gone, imagine um, how it would have revolutionized the world, you know, and the environment, you know, a free source of electricity. It's just mm-hmm. astonishing. You know, unfortunately... Um, uh, that project uh, stalled and died during the Great Depression after the stock market crash. Uh, it, took a, it took a few dollars to make these prototypes 
and um, it all eventually got scrapped. Um, but we still have the readings, and so uh, um, you know I've, I've talked about them and I've uh, sent them to engineers and various people around the country are are trying these things. You know, uh, here I am going off onto another tangent. I'm sorry. No, it, no. Got, in, in your mother's generation, when people started first hearing about Edgar Casey in a big way, it was always in relation to um, um, past life, you know, Atlantis, meditation, yoga, uh, these chakras. And it was done, um, I won't say at the exclusion, uh, but people just weren't interested in the science readings. Or, or the people who were interested in Casey weren't interested so much in science. And, and here, for you know, 30 years, these readings have been, haven't been examined uh, on science and engineering, on gravity, on laser light. It's just, it's just, uh, uh, you know, just, just as uh, holistic health has caught up to Edgar, well, so is science. And uh, I'm excited uh, to see what may come of some of these different projects. Um, one of the projects that I took on and a few of my friends, um, a physician came to Edgar Casey uh, and asked uh, in trance, you know, what's the best way to diagnose illness? And uh, Casey in trance uh, comes back um, non, non-invasively, uh, meaning you don't cut somebody open, take a look. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the acid comes back and says, well, how do you do it non-invasively? And he says, well, best way to do it is to read someone's aura. And so they say, well, what's an aura? And, and of course, Casey goes on to describe what I'm sure most of your listeners understand is the electrical energy field that surrounds all living things. And a uh, physician asks, well, how do I read an aura? And um Casey gives a remarkable uh, three or four readings uh, describing how to build a device uh, so that everybody can see auras. Casey says in the summary that there are many gifted people who naturally see auras. Um, The suggestion, however, is that um, uh, everybody has the capacity. Um, They just have learned not to do it. And we can talk about that. On a, later, but but in terms of this aura readings, um, a group in Miami, and this was relatively recently. This was uh, you know eight or nine years ago. Uh, took these readings and said, "Oh, I want to build one of these things," and uh, and they built one, and it's made with um, a series of colored prisms uh, that spin in front of your eyes like on a flywheel. Um, like a, a paddle wheel on an old paddle paddle board ship, uh, where you're you're looking through one series of lenses and then you turn it and you look through another and then another and another. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's a real interesting device, and lo and behold, it works. It's really it's just mind blowing. I, I absolutely love it. Um, one of these was made uh, in Casey's lifetime, and it didn't seem to work. Uh, and another was made right after he died, and it didn't seem to work. But the one that was made in Miami works, and it's uh, it's astonishing. I take it when I give lectures. I often take it with me uh, because uh, skeptics such as myself, you know, when I started out, scoff at the notion that uh, auras exist, and if if so, you can see you know, you can see and use them, use them in ways to diagnose illness. So I bring this out and I let them try it and, and uh, it, it blows them away. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, one, one of the, I just, I won't harp on this aura thing, except to say um, it answered for me uh, one of the biggest conundrums in the Casey work. Um uh, I, I, and it took me a year. We had already written one book on Casey before I, before I came to this, before I, I really understood it. Casey, in several important places in giving readings, says that everybody can do what I do. 
that uh, if you that that if you can pay a price um, or uh, follow instructions, whatever, that everybody is capable of giving readings of um, you know previewing the future, looking back into the distant past, and I I just dismissed all of that because you know. Uh, I guess I'm a more meat and potatoes person and I can't give readings and I don't see auras, at least without a device. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just didn't get it. I, you know, I just didn't get it. And then I started really working on this aura scope and I, and I gradually understood what Casey was saying, because uh, if you study these readings and how this aura scope works, you realize that, um, the horoscope is doing nothing except um, uh, helping you to do what you already can do. It, it, it's like you've, it, it tricks your brain into uh, looking or, or working with your eyes and your optical nerves in ways uh, that you haven't done since you were a little child. And uh, my thinking here is that as a, as a little infant, you know, you see your mother's smile and you see her bosom and you say, good, this is good. And you start focusing on these things in such a way that um, you very early on start screening out other stuff. You focus on the good and you screen out the other stuff and, and eventually um, – I, uh, I'm convinced that, that uh, as an infant, uh, you, you see auras and that as an adult, you've just sort of learned not to do it. And, and I'm suspecting that uh, many of Casey's skills, that we possess the latent ability to do some of these things. And, mm -hmm. and we've just trained ourselves not to do it. I don't know. Am, am I making any sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. um, does he say anything about how you can reawaken that? Yes, uh, he does. And um, uh, though there are a couple really cryptic remarks uh, when he when he's describing these things, because he says, you've got to pay a price. And uh, to be honest, I don't know what that price is. Right. Um, I don't know what I, whether, what, whether what he's talking, talking about dedication. Uh, I know he counsels people very strongly uh, not to use Ouija boards. Um, uh, that if you're going to channel, you, you've got to channel in a certain way and you've got to uh, ask for a divine force. You've got to go right to the, so you've got to go to a good force. You just don't want to welcome uh, unpleasantness. Uh, spirits well okay here's, right. a, here's a great example uh, I'll give a right from the readings um, uh, Anna Newmark uh, Anna Newmark was a um, uh, young artist uh, terribly gifted right out of the chute as, as, a, as a teenager just like spectacular uh, uh, ability to capture the human form and um, had a uh, art showing in Boston, uh, where where she spent, where she grew up most of her most of her life, and she did she did this uh, nude man, and uh, and it was uh, put on display, and the city fathers went bonkers. Suddenly there was newspaper critics like, oh, this is uh, a young a girl her age should not know this much about human anatomy. And uh, they some said it was pornographic. And anyway, uh, while all of that was going on, uh, the New York Art, Art School, Cooper Union, uh, today it's still in existence, a very, very important school for artists. And um, they offered her a scholarship to come to New York and uh, continue her artwork without harassment. And so she and her mother and her twin sister uh, came from Boston to New York. And um, she did spectacularly well. She had a one-woman show at the Carlisle Gallery at 16, 17 years old, just spectacular. And then something strange happened. Um, she showed up home uh, one night, and she went 
rushing through the front door and into her bedroom, slammed the door and locked it and wouldn't come out. And uh, eventually her mother and her sister got in there the next day of the day and they found her, you know, like sitting on the floor, uh, breaking her paintbrushes. And then eventually she started scraping uh, the pigment off of the canvases with her fingernails and she would go into hysterics and she wouldn't eat and, and it, she just became insane. And um, uh, the family had no choice and the neighbors complained and eventually, uh, literally she was taken to Ward's Island, which uh, is right next to, um, it's actually right next to Statue of Liberty. It's uh, an island right off of uh, South Ferry in New York and um, which has a big mental asylum. And she was put in a straitjacket and, uh, and it just was berserk. And it, it just, uh, family didn't know what to do. And, she, and her twin sister, um, uh, her twin sister uh, was walking down Broadway uh, to where they lived in the village. And um, suddenly there was this terrible rainstorm, thunder, just like somebody pouring a fire hose down on you and she rushed to get out of the rain off the street and she stepped into the back door of the McAlpin Hotel. And uh, it was it was an open door of a lecture room and I guess somebody left the, the, the back door open. I don't know. Anyway, she got in there and she was in stand, found herself standing in the back of a giant auditorium and there were a physician, there was a physician on stage giving a lecture about Edgar Casey and his medical treatments. And at that moment, she walked in drenched with water. This physician was talking about a New York postman. Um, and this is, you know, this is exactly, this is postal rage is what he was talking about. The, they wouldn't have used that term then. He was talking about a, a New York postman come home one night and suddenly started beating his wife and children and acting, you know, an otherwise uh, great husband uh, who just went off the rails and they couldn't explain it. And he was taken to a medical, he was taken into an insane asylum. And uh, luckily his sister uh, had a connection with Edgar Casey, and she got a reading for him. And it turned out that he'd been picking up um, boxes incorrectly and his spine had gotten out of adjustment and not enough blood was getting to a certain part of his head or something. And uh, Casey gave a treatment of uh, you know, massage therapy and osteopathy, and the guy got well. And so this physician was talking about this incredible reading, and a man, stand, a man stood up right next to you know, Anna Newmark's sister, and he jumped up and said that what that doctor is saying on the stage is true, because that postman was me. And it was a guy named Tom Scanlon. And Scanlon just, you know, uh, bore witness to this incredible trance reading and getting help. And now he was back in uniform as a postman. And so wow. Anna Newmark's sister just said, oh, my God, this is, this is, you're talking about my sister. And so after the lecture, she threw herself on the stage to this physician. And Edgar Casey was there and uh, a bunch of other people who were very helpful, and they immediately got readings for Anna Newmark on Ward's Island in a straitjacket, and they actually sent somebody over there, and she was strapped to a gurney, and her wrists were, were strapped down because, and even with a wrist strapped down, she'd somehow managed to use her fingernails to claw at the mattress, and mm. stuffing was coming out of the mattress. I mean, she was just uncontrollable. And so Edgar Casey gave a series of astonishing readings, just like uh, if you, I urge you to go on my this website, you know, CaseyUniverse.com, and you can read the Anna Newmark story, because Casey goes into this um, uh, in his reading, and and he says, well, uh, you got to first heal the body right away. You got to get her out of the mental institution, and, and he gives a whole lot of recommendations. And he says her uh, soul is hovering around her body right now. And you have to welcome the soul back into this, into this body. And she is not to be told what has happened. 
and this is really unusual in the KC readings because almost all the medical readings, if there's any, uh, almost all the medical readings, there's a description first off about how the person got the condition they are in. And like Mm -hmm. Tom Scanlon's medical reading, the postman is, he's been picking up packages incorrectly. Right. And a new mark is not said. But what's eventually revealed is that a man has left his calling card at the Carlisle Gallery or the gallery where she was showing her artwork. And he wanted to buy some of her paintings. And she was lured uh, up into his apartment uh, where she was brutally and very ugly assaulted. And she has, uh, has had sustained physical damage. Uh, and I guess how, anyway, I w- won't go into the ugliness of it, but it was very ugly and it involved a uh, umbrella. Oh, wow. And um, there's this magnificent series of Casey readings in, in which, in which, he describes uh, how she must be, how, how the uh, osteopath, uh, you know, massages exactly how and where must be massaged and, and, uh, and eventually um, uh, come the more spiritual readings as she comes to terms with this and, um, and then eventually is healed. And she went on to become a very, very well-known, very highly respected artist. Um, but there, you know, this is just one out of, you know, seven or 8,000, uh, people who, who were helped with Casey and it's, uh, it's mind blowing. It's wonderful. And, uh, and, uh, is there, these are stories that are relevant to all of us today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah it's, we could go on forever about all of these amazing stories and people that he helped and things that he said that turned out to be true. And I have confidence a whole lot more in the coming years will be proven to be true. Um, We have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes left. Is there anything that you would like to touch on that we haven't talked about yet? Uh, Well, I, 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 I think, um, uh, I would want listeners to understand, I mean, the, you know, the, the Casey story in and of itself is a very compelling uh, personal story. And I think any, anyone um, uh, who uh, may have psychic inclinations uh, or, or, you know, may manifest in certain ways, um, it would be well to read his story because um, he uh, he handled it all so well, and there are many, many cases of people born with gifts um, uh, that weren't so lucky. And mm-hmm. so this is a, a good, safe way to uh, go forward with it. Uh, another uh, really compelling uh, reason, I think, to uh, keep Casey in mind is as a resource. And the woman I fell in love with uh, who introduced me to Casey, uh, that's how she used it. Um, you know, these readings have, have now been studied long enough and organized in such a way as that, you know, um, you have arthritis, uh, you, you know, uh, you, <laughs> you have, um, you know, cold sores, whatever. Um, there's, a, there's Casey treatments uh, for these things. And uh, invariably, uh, they're not, you know, an, an expensive sort of deal. But, uh, so, you know, uh, Casey didn't give these rings because he was hawking products. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, very remarkable, perhaps one, one of the things that's most remarkable to my mind is that Casey didn't give a treatment to somebody unless that person uh, was capable of uh, being able to do it themselves or, or, or have it done. For example, um, um, breast cancer. So there, there's several readings in which uh, uh, people with, you know, women with very similar, almost identical conditions get different treatments 
And so one of the things we looked at is, well, why is this woman being told uh, she should go to the Mayo Brothers Clinic and this other woman uh, is told to get her husband, who is supposed to raise, uh, breed a certain type of rabbit, and that uh, he is to skin this rabbit and use it as a pelt, use the fatty tissue and put it against uh, his wife's breast. Um, so, you know, why do you have one treatment? And, well, what, what it turns out is that uh, the woman who is sent to the Mayo Brothers has the money to go to the Mayo Brothers. And uh, the farmer, you know, <laughs> the, the other one, you know, they don't have two cents. And um, so Casey, or who or what is coming through Casey, seems to know exactly uh, what these people are capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. Um, right. All of this is, I guess, is a roundabout way of saying um, uh, this is the real stuff and uh, you can uh, use the Casey material as a resource um, uh, on any question, whether it's, you know, whether you, whether it's banking and bankruptcy or divorce or uh, you know, or just uh, how to get rid of morning sickness. And so mm-hmm. it's there. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. And I was very um, blessed to be pointed in the right direction and have a look back. Yeah. Who did Edgar think he was tapping into for this info? Uh, well, it's a, a great question. Um, uh, Edgar himself I, I would would have said Jesus, and um, uh, this is this you know one can make a compelling argument that this is certainly some higher universal force, and it was. But I, I think if you really study the readings as we've done, uh, certain types of questions are hand, they hand, are handled in different ways. So I think some of the science readings, I think you have. Uh, uh, engineers or collectives uh, coming through to provide uh, answers, uh, but you do have uh, angelic be- beings, and, and uh, I don't know if we have time, uh, but I'll tell you uh, what, to my mind, was the most remarkable uh, you know, angelic being reading. Yeah, uh, do we have a couple of minutes left for yeah, that? Yeah, yes. All right. Okay, so here's a girl, young girl, um, uh, Faith Harding, uh, from Truckee, Trucksville, Pennsylvania, and uh, I, just, I think it's outside of Allentown, but um, manifesting all kinds of strange and unusual behaviors, even as a, just as a young child, and um, um, uh, had you know, as an adult, as a as a little child, just just the, the, would suddenly go into these fits at night, and she couldn't stop moving her arms and being wild. And a neighbor uh, a neighbor came to the mother and said, "You know, uh, uh, I think this child is trying to write something." And even it was you know three and four years old. And uh, anyway, they, they put crayons or some writing thing in the child's uh, hand when she had one of these fits and she suddenly started writing and she, what she was doing was automatic writing. And eventually she stopped doing automatic writing and she had, um, uh, she started prophesying and it was like a voice speaking through her and um, all kinds of bizarre stories were told about this, this little girl and uh, how um, she and her mother were on a bus uh, to um, Philadelphia and how suddenly the, this little girl suddenly started throwing a hissy fit or some sort of fit to the point where the driver had to pull off the side of the road and ask the mother and the child to leave. And the bus didn't get to um, uh, Philadelphia. The engine exploded. And then another incident in which the child said, going to burn down. And at that very moment, her, her school was on fire, even though she had no way of knowing it. Uh, and there was a, I, I won't go on, but there are many of these stories uh, of a, a healing, this gardener across the street 
uh, an apple orchard and how the gardener um, had a son with polio he carried with him and sat him under a tree uh, while he did his work and then he'd carry him home at night and how little Faith wandered out of her uh, house and went missing essentially and was found with this child and um, the next day the child, I mean, the child got up and walked home and was cured and so there was all kinds of buzz and so everybody wanted to know if this was the real thing or not and uh, they asked uh, Edgar Casey to give a reading on her and she was five years old and in this reading it, it, it's like if you were to pick uh, ten of the most remarkable readings she would have gotten two or three of them if you were to pick ten of the um, uh, readings in which some angelic presence comes through she'd get two of them I mean it's like it's like she wins. She just uh, hits it out of the park all the time. And it was uh, a read the first reading, um, you know, the skeptic that I was when I initially got into this, I just scoffed at, I just said, uh, can't be true. This is, you know, Archangel Michael supposedly comes through and delivers a message. And I was just, I just didn't believe it. And, uh, but I, but, you know, uh, I stuck at it and I started studying and studying it and, and uh, and all kinds of interesting things happened uh, that I couldn't explain. For example, uh, Edgar Casey would start giving a reading, um, um, say, well, the readings were like nine fifteen in the morning. After thirty years of giving readings, he he took he did uh, uh, he took very much. I won't say he took it for granted, but it became a routine. And so he'd be out in his garden. Uh, tending whatever he, do. he loved growing vegetables and it'd be nine o'clock and he'd have to go in take off his overalls and go in there and the stenographer Gladys Davis would be typing up yesterday's trance readings and his wife who conducted the readings would stop doing the dishes or whatever and they'd all come in and, and it went like clockwork and um, only this time it didn't and the first strange thing was as Edgar started going into trance, uh, there was a sudden wind like blew right through the room. And um, Gladys Davis, the stenographer who was there getting ready to take down what was said, got upset by it because she had typed up yesterday's readings and they were on the, on the table on the steno desk next to her. And they blew off and all the pages went on the floor and, uh, she was upset because they, she hadn't numbered the pages and she, she, she thought she'd have to... Anyway, she got down on her hands and knees when she realized the window was closed and the door was closed. Like, where did this wind come from? And as she was down there, uh, suddenly she started crying. And it wasn't anything, anything anybody said or anything. It was just suddenly she started crying. And she looked up and tears were going down Edgar Casey's eyes. Tears were going down Edgar's wife's eyes who conducted the readings. And it was like there was some vibrational change in the room. And suddenly uh, Edgar started speaking in trance, only it wasn't the normal voice. There were two voices. And the first voice said, Hark ye, Archangel Michael, doth approach. And uh, seconds later, Archangel Michael comes through in this reading, speaking through Casey and says, you know, these are my words. You can go back and you can go, you, oh, you know, check out the, check out the story. Uh, you know, and it's in both of our books on Edgar Casey. and Archangel Michael comes back and says, uh, Harky, you have, um, you know, this is God's gift to the 21st century. You have protect this young child because she's been given gifts far beyond those Edgar Casey himself and um, you are to protect her you are to love her and um, and she will never have a normal childhood because she's not a normal child and anyway it's so uh, you know I didn't believe that story when I first heard it I, I just was so you can see the see how I was at that time and I look back and I sort of laugh but you you go through the original papers and um, 
and you see actual dried teardrops on the steno pad. Um, wow. Uh, you, you start digging down, the further you drill, the more the real story comes true. And uh, so, it, you know, and for us, it was um, uh, finding faith and finding Faith Harding, and we went and found her. And, uh, boy, you know, I think the readings are true. It's, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just one of these exciting things about studying Casey now. And I keep calling it a renaissance because it is. Yeah, it is. Um, I thought of one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and that is the relationship um, if you could share with the audience uh, between Gladys and was it Gertrude, um, yeah, his wife, the, and then the stenographer. Gladys, Gladys and... Davis was the uh, stack secretary and stenographer, and Gertrude was Edgar's wife. And um, uh, wasn't there some Gladys, mention that they had been yeah, on a yeah, yeah. reincarnation they, journey? They, they, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, Edgar had just started doing uh, past life readings after, you know, years of giving medical readings. Suddenly this new type of reading came out. And um, um, one of the things that came out initially was, oh, isn't it, you know, that Gladys Davis, the stenographer, uh, why she was able to take down dictation from Edgar as easily as she could. And uh, it was because they'd been together in a past life. And, oh, isn't that interesting? And so further readings were conducted. Oh, and they'd been together uh, in many past lives. And then uh, more readings were uh, given and says, oh, well, that's why they're so attracted to each other. And, you know, you've got to realize that Edgar's a very devout and, and he's not about to cheat on his wife or anything. And Gertrude, his wife is conducting these readings as it's coming through. And so they're naturally hesitant to be going down this road in the first place, this whole reincarnation yeah. road, which is foreign to all of them. And, and, uh, and, uh, then what comes out is just really mind blowing. It's just, well, why are they so attracted to each other? Because they were one soul. They were twin soul. They are twin souls. What's a twin soul? A twin soul, and you go back to the very earliest primeval time when souls first started incarnating in the earth, uh, you know, to earth, and they had been at one time one soul, both male and female, the same you know, soul, and they become divided. And so they're attracted to each other because... Uh, at some ancient, you know, primordial time in uh, Earth's history, they had actually been one soul. And so this created a, one hell of a love triangle here. You know, my Nancy always jokes, jokes about it, the good news and the bad news. And yeah. uh, uh, the, good, the good news is you found your twin soul, you know, the person uh, with whom uh, you can experience life in its most fullest because it is truly one, you know, soul coming back together. Uh, but the bad news, of course, is, is your boss and is your best friend's uh, husband. Mm -hmm. But the, the, those readings, uh, you know, if you, if you get beyond the, um, uh, like the soap opera side of it, this, this sort of love triangle going on in psychic, they're really, really interesting because they talk about birthmarks. For, for instance, they say if Edgar were naked and, and Gladys were naked and they stood next to each other, stood face to face, they would have similar, you would see uh, body marks on them which are identical to each other. And uh, and then that opened up into a whole interesting discussions on um, other uh, physical manifestations from past lifetimes and how you can um, uh, understand, you can, you know, pick out Atlanteans, people from Atlantis uh, who had incarnations in Atlantis, 
by uh, certain uh, marks uh, on their temples uh, or the fact that when they get tired or stressed out, uh, their eye twitches or their lower lip sometimes twitches. All kinds of really interesting, strange things like this, things you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't, you don't normally hear about. Right. And I go, you know, anyway, it's, uh, there, there's, there's everything in this. And this is, as I, as, as you know, from reading our first book, you know, Andrew Casey yeah. and American Prophet. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's, it's an amazing story. Um, so would, could you go ahead and just repeat where people can get uh, more information on you and um, yeah. your yeah. website? Possibly uh, well, uh, you know, uh, first, first of all, Casey is spelled C-A-Y. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people naturally misspell it. They spell it as it sounds, but it's C-A-Y-C-E. So we have a site called Casey Universe, C-A-Y-C-E Universe, one word, dot com. And uh, we, we've only had it for, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, a little over four or five months. Um, we really started it at the beginning of the pandemic stuff because um, we just want to, I stopped lecturing. Um, and uh, so we started posting on some of the articles and stuff we've written. And uh, so you can find it there and like uh, check out uh, in October, if you go to the website, you have to give your, uh, email address, but once you put your email address in, you you can look at some of the things. And I've given, I put like five or six videos of of lectures and powerpoints and stuff that I've done. But I but we I have articles on some of these people, and there's a little synopsis on Edgar Casey. And of course, if you go to uh, Amazon.com under Sydney Kirkpatrick, you'll see some of my books before Casey and after Casey. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. It's fine. We we don't, you know. I I I initially uh, wanted to write as a uh, wanted to make movies, and uh, I didn't want to do books. And uh, even though I come from a long line of family of writers, and uh, huh, I made a movie. And it was uh, worked on a movie there, and it was called. It was declared to be the worst movie of 1983, People Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I turned to books, and uh, and I really suddenly found found my stride. And so my first book was a big bestseller, and I was uh, uh, going on from there. And uh, when I got tangled up in Casey. But I look back now and I, and I see so much of what happened was in preparation that if I wasn't such a skeptic and Nancy wasn't such a converted believer, we wouldn't have done what we did because it was in that tug of war. And, and this gets to the heart of what the bigger message in the Casey readings are, is that we're not in this alone. We're in it as a team. Casey talks about soul groups, talks about, you know, you don't do what you do alone. You do it in tandem. You do it with other people. And it's, it's in, in the combination of working together. Um, you know, uh, the imaginary playmates, right? You know, one of the last readings Casey gave in his life um, discussed, you know, he's an old man and is looking back at his childhood and said, what was that all about? Who were those children I saw were they real were they not real who or what were they and the source you know who or what comes through Casey essentially says well they're real to you as children because that's the only way you as a child could have understood understood them to be their souls their spirits and they were hovering around you and they appeared to you as children uh, uh, because you would they were you they, because you needed companionship And so um, these were souls surrounded Edgar Cayce in, um, you know, in in the etheric form. And as they disappeared, they incarnated into flesh and blood. And Gladys Davis, you know, the woman who became a stenographer, had been one of those imaginary playmates, as did Gertrude, his wife, as did a a wealthy Jewish stockbroker in New York, Um, 
these were the soul group. And one, one could look at the big mistake, I think, is in uh, understanding Edgar Casey as Casey's work or his work. It's really, it's a team. And, and you could look at his life story as slowly assembling that soul group uh, who come together and work together and succeed in what they're doing. And if you look at some of the other stories in the Casey work, you'll see similar groups who find each other, partners who find each other and they come together and they're trying to do something. Um, sometimes a lot of the off, very often they fail in Casey's, um, in that case, they succeeded and they, they held it together, you know, despite the fact that there's this, you know, love triangle, uh, okay, you know, that forms, um, despite the fact that Casey's arrested, you know, for practicing medicine without a license. Uh, you know, he goes to jail twice. And, uh, you know, um, despite all of that, they, the fact that they kept it together is, is a great story, um, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, yeah. fascinating story that that he lived. Well, I want to thank you so much, um, Sydney. It's been an honor speaking with you tonight, and thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, you can find us at unexplainabletruths.com. And until next time, everyone, take care. <laughs> <laughs>